How are you? Today is Friday, Friday, June 24th, 2022. My name's Jeremy, and this is my first cup book. This is my Friday book. Friday. How was your Thursday? What did you do? What were the highlights? Did you train? Did you not train? Did you do a whole bunch of work about martial arts that had nothing that, to do with your own personal training? Like me. Good morning to Nathan and Dennis and Mark and all the rest of you, whether you're watching live later or listening. You guys want a bird update? I can give you a bird update. Oh, man. Stupid bird. Good morning, John. Oh, coffee came up perfect. Oh, this is a great way to start the day. Perfect coffee, talking to all of you. So I posted on my personal Facebook yesterday this, this ongoing saga of the bird. Uh, tomorrow we'll make, we'll make uh, well, this is two work weeks of the bird. And suggestions ranged from the unhelpful to the sarcastic. There were a few people who were actually trying to be helpful. I said, hey, here's a bird. He's depriving me of sleep. And so many people talked about blocking the windows. And I said, you know what? Maybe, maybe this bird has just created a habit. Right? We talk about habits on the show. Maybe I just need to break this habit. Because I don't want to cover all of my windows. Indefinitely. Because that's going to suck. Right? Like a lot of people suggesting, we'll just cover your windows. Do you know what windows are? Why do you have windows? Did you once cut a hole in the side of your house and say, you know, I'm going to enjoy this wonderful sunlight until a single bird decides that it doesn't want them to be here. And then I'll just capitulate and cover my windows until it flies south for the winter. I didn't think that. I didn't say that. Good morning, Jenny. But I said, you know what? Let me, let me see if putting up some cardboard changes things. And I thought I had it. I put cardboard up on the two windows and probably two thirds of the windows. It's it's a sequence of three windows connected in one casing. There's the word, window casing. And saw the bird come back and like look confusingly. Like I felt like there was a thing I used to do here. You know, birds are kind of dumb and don't have great memories. And then it flew away and I was like, all right, I got this, nothing. Nothing. I even woke up this morning at like five o'clock, like, cause it's become a habit and I'm laying there and I'm like, oh, I don't hear a bird. And I was just drifting off to sleep again to get, you know, my last 45 minutes. Bird is sitting on the cardboard, tapping on the window. I'm running out of ideas. Good morning, Brian. So uh, there is a good chance that I handle this in a way that I really don't want to handle. And... Uh, One person posted understanding, you know, that there's a cardinal at their house that just batters at all of their windows. She's like, what am I supposed to do? Cover all of my windows? I kind of like having windows. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. 
Um, I am going to be restructuring the grapevines, hopefully at some point this weekend. And fingers crossed that somehow that changes things. I don't know. I've looked for a nest. I can't find a nest. Maybe I can find a nest and relocate it. All right. Brian says, I'm beginning to think it's a mockingbird. Literally, it might be. Cat says, am I watching a rerun? Uh, yes. Yes, you are. Because this is all consuming. This is, this is like... I've taken to shutting all the doors down there in, in the bedroom, putting on earbuds, working in my office with the door closed to not hear the bird because it's that upsetting to me now. Maybe it's time to call in a bird specialist. I don't know what that is. I, I'm expecting that anybody that knows birds would come and say, oh, yes, that's a that's a spotted warbler. Those are endangered. You shouldn't mess with them. In fact, legally, we have to take this cardboard down because you're disrupting its whatevers. Yeah. Anyway, moving on. So yesterday was a good day. It was a productive day. I brought on verbally two new clients. Uh, one of which is a martial arts school. Very excited for that. I hope long-term all my clients become martial arts schools. I have so much more fun working with them than I do with other clients. And, and I do, I like working with all of my clients, but working with martial arts schools means I get to take an additional context and add it into my skill set. You know, when I'm working with someone, you know, let's say a veterinarian or a retail store, I've got knowledge I can draw on, but that knowledge is not as deep as my knowledge of martial arts and the martial arts industry and what it's like to have a school and what it's like to be a student. And I can really help these schools. And the schools that I'm working with say really, really good things. So I think I'm doing a good job. Tennis says this bird has no quit in it. He or she must be a martial artist. Entirely possible. Cad's getting, Cad's getting the sarcasm here. I appreciate it. Oh shoot, didn't think of that. They might even tell you to move your house. And Jenny says maybe a distant relative of the Taekwondo. <laughs> oh, you guys, I love you guys. All right, so yeah, yesterday. Um, Andrew was on Everyday Martial Artist. Uh, Brian, I don't remember his last name and I apologize for that. Uh, Brian's been on Martial Arts Radio, but he had, and, and I've been on his show. He had Andrew on. It was a great conversation. I really hope you check it out. I posted a link to it somewhere. I don't remember where. Oh, Patreon. I posted links in Patreon. Uh, go check it out. Everyday Martial Artist episode, whatever Andrew is, whatever episode that was, 70, 60 something. Uh, really, really nice conversation. And it's nice to hear, you know, Andrew's been on the show. I interviewed Andrew back in the day. We spent a lot of time on camera and on mic now. So hearing him even a bit more refined in that presentation was really nice for me you know, observing how he engages when, when other people are talking to him. Because almost 100% of the time, if he's responding, it's because I'm asking him something. So it was nice to be on the outside of that. And I hope you guys do check it out. Uh, what else happened yesterday? I don't... I made a big list for the weekend. All the things I got to do. Dealing with the bird is not one of them. You guys ever do that? Put together... You know, your, your own to-do list, your own honey-do list. I don't have a honey to tell me what to do, so I got to make my own. And most of it is outside, and it's going to be 90 degrees. So we're going to be playing the, the morning and evening game on the outside things, doing some prioritization. I've got I'm going to a social event this evening. There's supposed to be another social event tomorrow evening. Um, we will see if I go to those, that one. The one tonight I will definitely go to. 
Yeah. It's going to be a busy weekend. What are you guys doing? John says, the fact that the bird came back to the window with the cardboard, using the cardboard as a perch is a good sign, in my opinion. It didn't move on to a new window. The next step I would take would be to completely exclude access to the windows he's been using. Yeah, but then it's permanently dark in my bedroom, man. I don't want to do that. It's, you're right. There's, it is clear that this bird, so here's an important point. And because I, I was adamant that the bird was not seeing its reflection. I was wrong. Here's why I, I was wrong. Because I was thinking about it like a person. I wasn't thinking about it like a bird. I, I've seen plenty of windows that are really shiny and polished and birds are like, oh, that's a way through and bonk. This is, these are dirty windows. I'm also not a bird. The bird's like, oh, that's a bird. I am just really hopeful that by moving the grapevines up and out a bit and pruning them back a little, because it is time to do that. I do that every year, that it will open up the space in there and the birds will, the bird will decide it's no longer an issue. If I have to cut the vines from in front of the windows, I will do that. I, I've tried to keep enough vine in front that it blocks a lot of the sun and it helps keep the, the bedroom cooler. But. John says, I, I appreciate this consultation. Has the bird ever tapped on windows besides the three in question? Is the proximity of those windows to vines why he chooses those windows? Uh, I've not witnessed him at other windows, but there's also like no time. This is constant through the day. Um, so in one of the suggestions online, someone was saying that if there was no vine for him to perch on to tap, he would not tap except that he has no problem because there are three windows. One of them has no vines in front of it. He has no problem flying at it with like his death claws. And, you know, imagine you've seen like an eagle come down and like attack something and pick it up. It does that. It's just much smaller and it's window. Jenny says, my sister and her family are coming into town and we will be getting together, but no definitive plans yet. Got to talk to Jenny yesterday. We had a team meeting. It was a fun team meeting. It was a short team meeting. We are getting efficient. I appreciate that. Dennis is heading into Manhattan tomorrow. First time since we went, he and I, together actually for a mirror event. Should be fun. Nice. Brian says, cut the vines and install ceramic tint for head reduction. <laughs> uh if you didn't know, Brian's a bit of a car, car nerd. Oh, heat reduction. Okay. I was assuming you were talking about like doing something ceramic and set the heads on the motor. Uh, that makes more sense for heat reduction. And John's wondering if the bird will move on if he can't access the windows for a little while. I'm going to guess no. There's something, there's something going on. There's something in this bird's head or it's got a nest that I can't find. There's something going on. Um, I have to solve the problem. This is the first time I've lived here for 10 years. This is the first time I've ever had this with those windows. I'm very annoyed. Gad, Gad and I have the same sense of humor. Call, build a birdhouse, call an exhibit to pimp it up for you. And he'll move in his new abode very fast for sure. Yes. That's a brilliant idea. Pimp my birdhouse. I'm, you know what? Here's the funny thing. That's actually a brilliant idea for like a short run HGTV show. They probably couldn't get Exhibit to do it, but they could probably get, who would they get? I don't know. Snoop seems to like to do ridiculous things like that. They might not be able to afford it, but that would be a, that would be a great show. And it's the type of show that people are like, that show's on HGTV. I'll watch that because it'd be funny. Take care, Andy. 
All right, let's move on to the jokes, because it is Friday. Frank did give us jokes. Shout out and thank you as always to Frank, and thanks to Josh for our theme music. Let's do the jokes. And I still want to hear what you guys are doing over the weekend. The jokes for Fun Day Friday. Today is swim a lap day. It's going to be hot this weekend. Maybe I will go swimming. Probably not. My local public swimming pool had a big sign on the wall. It said, welcome to our OOL. Notice there's no P in it. Let's keep it that way. Uh, I've seen that sign at plenty of people's backyard pools. Did you know fish swim in schools? Except on a Sunday when they swim in churches and pray to cod. I had a dream I was swimming in an ocean of orange soda. Turns out it was just a fantasy. Yes. Why well, my swimming instructor asked, what's your favorite stroke? I said it was the one that finished off my mother-in-law. <laughs> That's so mean. That's so mean. That's good. A young boy was swimming in the sea on his own. So I threw some binoculars at him. I yelled to him, you need supervision. I'm re-watching all the Pirates of the Caribbean movies and I started number five yesterday. And, you know, it's easy to forget how great those films are. They, they're awesome. Great acting, great dialogue, wonderful timing. The direction is phenomenal. It's just, they're great movies. My friend really wanted a swimming pool. He's asking us for donations to help achieve his dream. So I gave him a bottle of water. <laughs> How do you persuade elephants to go swimming? Remind them that they already have their trunks on. Why do sharks only swim in salt water? Because pepper water makes them sneeze. If you think swimming with dolphins is expensive, you should try swimming with sharks. It cost me an arm and a leg. Well, if there's one thing I've learned from my daughter's first swimming lessons, she's definitely not a witch. <laughs> That's a great joke. I like that one. Pour more coffee. What do you call a small pole that can swim? A tadpole. Did anyone else's parents teach them to swim by throwing them in the lake? I think the swimming part was the easy part. Getting out of that burlap sack was tricky though. Ooh, that one's dark. Ending on a dark one today, Frank. All right. Those were some good jokes. I, you know, it continues to blow me away how great of a job Frank does. I sh I'm not surprised anymore, but you know, you step into a subject like swimming. How many great swimming jokes can there be? Oh, apparently quite a few. Jenny suggesting Flava Flav for our Pimp My Birdhouse show. His catchphrase is strong. I could see it working. I, I can see an opening sequence where it's him pulled back from a cutaway of the of a birdhouse where you get like the top of the clock and the glasses like this this line right here i can see that brian's getting a haircut saturday overdue from his barbershop canceling some saturdays Grr. celebration of life for a friend's grandmother she was awesome otherwise probably cleaning the house for the contractor visit on monday oh nice what are you doing um there is a memorial service for someone tomorrow that I know through uh, martial arts. Brian, I'm, I'm sure you saw that Carl had passed. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to go. I'm on the fence. Um, I don't enjoy such things. And I'm very aware that when I go to a funeral or a memorial service, I'm not going for the person who passed. They've passed. I'm going for either myself or for other people. And I'm not sure that either tips the scales in this case. Um, he was a good man, really good man.
somebody that I appreciated, somebody who chimed in at interesting times on social media, especially to offer perspective. And I value that. Oh, let's move this. Dennis says the fantabulous Frank Wood. Yes. Yeah. Great jokes. Yeah, so um, I may spend the day working in the yard, working hard, even in the sun, knowing that if he was, if he had not passed, that's likely how Carl would have spent his weekend because he was a farmer. He, he did logging operations for people with horses. That was part of how he made money because there are places you can't bring heavy equipment. He would bring his big old horses. And I thought that was really cool. All right, moving on. Frank gave us more because he always gives us more and I appreciate that. And I see, I see a name, Jack Dempsey by name, William Harrison Dempsey, also called the Manassa Mahler, born June 24th, 1895. Died May 31st, 1983, American World Heavyweight Boxing Champion, regarded by many as the apotheosis of the professional fighter. Do you know about Jack Dempsey? I think the most telling thing about Jack Dempsey, forget his record, forget who he fought, forget any of that. Read or listen to old media stuff about Jack Dempsey. You know, them calling the fight on the radio or write-ups about him. It, it's remarkable. And I don't know what the modern equivalent might be. Maybe Jordan in his prime because nobody could touch him. That might be the closest thing that I can think of. He held the title from July 4th, 1919, when he knocked out Jess Willard in three rounds in Toledo, Ohio, until September 23rd, 1926. That's over seven years, for those of you not counting, when he lost a 10-round decision to Gene Tunney in Philadelphia. Dempsey fought 84 bouts, winning 62, 51 of which were by knockout. It's a lot of fights. Dempsey started boxing in 1914 under the name Kid Blackie. In 1918 and early 1919, he compiled an impressive number of knockouts most in the first round, to earn a fight with Willard. The 37-year-old champion proved no match for young Dempsey, who attacked ferociously from the starting belt and knocked Willard to the floor seven times in the first round. If you know anything about boxing, that tells us, hey, the rules were a little bit different back then. That would have been a TKO easily. These days. Right? Yeah. Even more primitive in its intensity was Dempsey's title defense against Argentine heavyweight Luis Angel Firpo in New York on September 14th, 23. After being knocked out of the ring in the first round, Dempsey battered Firpo into defeat in the second. During the next three years, Dempsey fought only exhibition matches, and at the age of 31, he found that he had aged excuse me, too much to deal with the carefully trained Tunney in their first fight. On September 22nd, 1927 in Chicago, they met again in the famous Battle of the Long Count, in which Dempsey forfeited his chance for his seventh round knockout by standing over the fallen Tunney rather than going to a neutral corner of the ring. Tunney recovered to win another 10 round decision. Oof. In his boxing style, Dempsey kept on the offensive almost continuously, bobbing up and down and moving from side to side as he delivered short swinging blows out of a crouch. His constant movement, the speed of his attack constituted his defense. In the 30s, Dempsey appeared in many exhibitions, but he was never again a serious contender for the championship. In 1940, he had three knockout victories over unaccomplished opponents before retiring to referee boxing and wrestling matches. In World War II, he served as a lieutenant commander in the Coast Guard. He eventually became a successful restaurateur in New York City. Dempsey published several books on boxing. His autobiographies include Round by Round, Dempsey, and Dempsey, the autobiography of Jack Dempsey. He was inducted into Ring Magazine's Boxing Hall of Fame in 1954. I don't give homework anymore. If you've been watching the show, listening to the show for a long time, you know that I used to give homework. Rather than giving you homework, 
on a convention, like a consistent basis. I think once in a while, there are things that pop up that I think you should do. I'm going to suggest that you, you find a little bit of like stuff from the, the twenties about Jack Dempsey, go back, like find some audio, find some newspaper articles and just see how they talk about him. It, it's something that's always struck me about Jack Dempsey. He's, I mean, there's, there's only one. He's the equivalent in fighters to Mike Tyson today. And I say that because back then everyone knew who Jack Dempsey was. Everyone today knows who Mike Tyson is. They all know he's a boxer. He's one of the most famous people on the planet. They may have never seen him fight. They may know nothing about boxing, but everybody knows who Mike Tyson is. And they did even back when he was fighting. Ah, so Brian says contractors for small list. The bank said we had to get done. That's cool. Jenny says she feels the same way about memorial services. I do pretty good at dealing with death. Typically show up to support others and listen to stories. Yeah. So Jack Dempsey. You know, one of the things that I would find interesting, maybe not so much today, because there's, there's, I feel like people who box today do so for different reasons than say a boxer would have boxed in the 20s. I think a lot of people who boxed in the 20s would have done karate or kung fu if they'd had the opportunity. <clears throat> so I would imagine that a lot of the sentiment, a lot of the personal growth, a lot of the uh, dedication to training for purposes beyond competition would have existed back then. I would have liked to have worked out with those guys. I know virtually nothing about boxing. I can put my hands on people. I can punch, but not very well, not compared to my kicking anyway. And I think that'd be really interesting. You know, what would it be like to work out with Jack Dempsey? You guys ever think about this stuff? I think about this stuff. What would it be like to have Jack Dempsey come into a, a karate class and teach everybody how to punch? What would Jack Dempsey have looked like as a fighter if he had cross trained in Taekwondo? Right? Like what, what would he have taken from it? And you can say, oh, you know, he, he wouldn't have taken anything. He wouldn't have needed anything. To a lot of people, Muhammad Ali is the greatest boxer of all time. And, you know, regardless of where you put him on the list, he's, he's still near the top. Muhammad Ali learned things from Bruce Lee. Muhammad Ali learned things from George Dillman. He was a better fighter because of his cross training with people who did other combat sports. In, in both cases, martial arts, with martial arts. So I can't imagine that he wouldn't have taken something talks about the footwork, the head movement. I'm sure there was something there. So these are the things I think about. A diverse martial artist, a better martial artist, as far as I'm concerned. Well, I'm going to send you on your way to your weekend. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I hope you get your projects done. I hope you get to sleep in. I hope you get to drink tasty coffee or whatever it is that you do on your weekends. And if you're working all weekend, I hope your work is productive and easy. If you want to support us in all that we're doing, join the Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. Pick something up at whistlekick.com using the code first cup one five, or check out the whole list of all the things we're doing at whistlekick.com slash family. Ha! Ha! You thought I forgot. I didn't forget. If you have questions or comments, you can leave them on the Facebook page, facebook.com slash first cup of Jeremy, or email me with any feedback, any commentary whatsoever on the show and what we do. Jeremy at whistlekick.com. First cup is the only martial arts morning show airing weekdays, Monday through Friday, 6.30 a.m. U.S. Eastern time on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitch. And if you haven't, please subscribe, share, turn on notifications, Hit the thumbs up button or the like button or the heart button or the start, whatever the buttons are that you've got that you can hit 
to tell wherever you're watching, hey, this is a thing I want to know about, go ahead and do that because we have fun. And if you don't get notified, you might miss out on the fun. Take, oh, you know what? We'll end on Gad's comment here. Why hasn't anyone made a movie about that? Going in a time machine and visit martial artists from the past, a bit like Bill and Ted, but with a martial twist. That is a brilliant idea. Um, if anybody thinks that's a cool idea, check out, and you like podcasts, check out the Dead Authors podcast, uh, specifically the two-parter that they do with, quote, L. Ron Hubbard. It's hysterical. Uh, it is probably the funniest podcast I've done or I've, I've heard uh, a bunch of people who are part of the um, Upright Citizens Brigade, Brigade participated in that. They, it's, it's a defunct podcast, but it's still worth listening to. I could see bringing that style, that flavor of humor and, and kind of approach into that movie. I can't wait till we have a movie division, you guys. There are so many projects I want to do. When I wrote Faith, it's a screenplay. It, I, I did that intentionally as I wrote it. For someone to take Faith and turn it into a screenplay will take you a day. You just have to break it out instead of saying, Gerald said, just Gerald, colon. Like, it's going to be really straightforward to do. Um, I've actually thought about doing a uh, radio play out of it first, but we have a lot of things going on and I can't handle more projects. So there you go. A bit behind the scenes and how my brain works. Have a great weekend, everyone. I will see you back here on Monday. Take care. Peace.